so I'm, I'm Stephen Bond. Uh, I work for the Intertribal Agricultural Council and had the great fortune to um, participate in the, the development of this conference and very exciting. So um, I see here that um, in the bio and the, um, on the talk um, that we're going to be discussing about um, uh, uh, um, kind of the um, where agriculture and nutrition meet. Because nutrition is is the what we read on the back of labels, and agriculture is is a cultural practices and uh, defines um, the um, what's going to be on that label inevitably. But um, but that's normally handled in two separate conferences. So that's kind of the exciting aspect of this conference. Um, so um, so let me um, um, read Holly Hunt's um, Dr. Hunt's um, bio um, because it's better written than I could probably describe, and we don't know one another personally. So um, Holly Hunts um, is an associate professor of consumer economics at Montana State University in Boisman, uh, Montana. Her research is transdisciplinary uh, and focuses on the connection between agriculture, food, nutrition, and health. Um, current projects include analyzing the nutritional aspects of the food package for the food distribution uh, program um, on Indian reservations, FDIPR as we all call it, I'm sure. Um, promoting uh, innovative strategies to support the food um, sovereignty movement, especially through changes in FDIPR, helping develop and market highly nutritious crops, creating an accurate and culturally relevant nutrition uh, monitoring uh, mobile app, enhancing K-12 school performance on reservations, by improving child nutrition and providing rich research experiences at MSU for tribal college students interested in careers in agriculture, food, nutrition, and or in health. Um, as a consumer economist, uh, economist um, Holly's passion is, ensure, um, that, is to ensure that consumers have all the information they need to make good choos- choices for their, themselves and their families. So sounds like good stuff to me. Okay, so um, I have a lot of slides, um, and I chuckled when the speaker at lunch said that she could talk for days. I'm like, oh, me too, maybe a week on FDIPR. <laughs> so I'm going to try to go sort of fast, um, but if you have questions, be sure to ask me. I'm going to try to leave some time at the end um, for questions too. So um, I um, want to talk to you about FDIPR, and for the first part, It'll sound like I'm sort of against FDIPR, but I'm not. Um, and so the punchline's coming where I'm like, no, I think it's, I think it's a good thing. Um, and you'll see my name and also um, Ed Dratz. I'm so privileged um, at MSU to work in this transdisciplinary group. So I get to work with biochemists and immunologists and plant scientists, and I'm the consumer person. Um, and they go, why do you think like that? Why do you think like that? Um, but together, we finally think a lot better. So um, I'm going to present just a little bit of some um, research that we've done in Ed's multi-million dollar biochemistry lab, and I really can't take credit for it, except for I did the dishes, but <laughs> really, <laughs> it helped. So, um, and we, we just sort of co-present these days for their work. So, um, let's go here. So in case you're not hip, the Food Distribution Program in Indian Reservations, I kept saying all of those long words for a while um, until I, um, watch the cool people, and the cool people call it FDIPR, so I invite you to be cool, and you can call it FDIPR, too. Of course, most people call it commods, but um, there we go. So um, FDIPR came about um, at the same time as the Supplemental Nutrition um, and Assistance Program, SNAP, food stamps. Um, There was a commodity foods program, and of course, there's a long history of the U.S. government providing food on reservations. Um, but during the Great Depression was a more formal commodities food program, um, and FDIPR is just an extension of that. In 1972, legislation passed um, to move away from commodities for most people and towards food stamps, and it was a, it was a really great idea. Um, Senator uh, George McGovern ar- argued that on Indian reservations didn't have full service grocery stores, so they should um, the low income citizens of red- reservations should have a choice between food stamps or um, FDIPR. All right, I want to talk just a minute about wicked problems. Are any of you familiar with the wicked problem literature? It's awesome, and I missed it for uh, 40 years. It started in the 70s, but um, wicked problems are really inextricably intertwined 
And so here's a good picture of them. So these are ordinary problems are right there. And wicked problems, if you think like a ball of yarn or Christmas lights or jewelry or something, it always gets knotted up. And you're trying to loosen it up on one end, and it just gets tighter and tighter on the other end. You're like, oh. <laughs> so wicked problems are like that. You can think you're fixing them on one end, and all you're doing is really tightening them up on the other end. And... Um, <laughs> This like cartoon guy. Every wicked problem is the symptom of another wicked problem. So, um, Fidipper was kind of a reductionist, and by that I mean like a really simple solution to a really complicated problem. Um, we have poverty and hunger and um, the destruction of traditional food sources and uh, allotted land, which means that you don't have the title, which means that you can't use it as collateral at the bank, which means that it's, you have a lack of access to credit. Um, and reservations were located, are located on some of the least productive quality um, agricultural land. Um, and there's, our government put up all sorts of barriers to entering um, the market with trade. So there was a demand, 1972, on reservations for a normal food market, but um, people didn't have any money, <laughs> and so suppliers didn't have a big incentive to, to come in. And so the USDA thought, oh, great, well, we'll just give everybody free food. And that, um, <laughs> that just spawned more problems. So. Um, it um, gave people poor health outcomes from cheap, low-quality food. Um, and there was food spoilage because people could only get food once every 30 days. And most Americans don't buy food once every 30 days. They, they buy it every week or so, so it stays fresh. And it just reinforced the generational food trauma that was already there. And um, free food sort of suppressed the economic opportunities that would have been there had people had money to spend at a store. So it did solve um, transportation costs for uh, clients and storage issues and uh, having all of that food that never, ever, ever, ever goes bad um, avoided some issues with poor quality, but it just caused all these other problems. So um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Fidipper. Um, and if you have questions, let me know. But I want to just sort of give you the basics. How does it work? So there's 276 centers in the United States nationwide. There's seven in Montana, where I'm from. Um, if you talk to the Fidipper directors, they say they serve about 100,000 people a year. Um, the official USDA record is 88,615. but um, they say 100,000. I just wanted to give you both numbers. Uh, so it serves low-income li families living on reservations. You don't have to be native. Um, it just on a reservation, near a reservation, or in these specially designated areas, mainly those are in Oklahoma. Um, and folks are usually eligible for both Fidipper and SNAP, but you can only choose one. So you, you can't have both, only one. And the food package arrives every 30 days. And there's um, lots of different ways that they deliver it, store concepts, warehouse, tailgates. So um, I thought I would start at the beginning. This guy's name is Steve, which I can remember because my husband's Steve, but that's not my husband, Steve. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> so in Kansas City, a mile underground in this abandoned lime mine, like how could I make this up? I'm not making this up, is the National Food Warehouse. There's 14 million tons of food underneath, and I got to go see it. And Steve runs it, so he was our host. Uh, and that's what it looks like, because there's a lot, 14 million tons of food, <laughs> a lot of food there. And uh, it's kind of blurry, because my camera's not so great, but commodity cheese. As far as you can see, stacks, stacks. So this guy's like, take a picture of me with commodity cheese. I'm like, oh, of course. So there it is, commodity cheese. We were there. There's another smaller warehouse in Idaho, but most of the food from Fidipper goes through this um, Kansas City, mile underground, weird place. Um, 
and then it goes out in the center. So um, this is my friend Dana down at the Crow Reservation, which is about three and a half hours from uh, where I live in Bozeman, and my colleague Ed and, and one of my um, students who's actually Salish. And so we're posing for the picture. That's what it looks like um, when you get there. And um, also down at Crow, they have a place for nutrition education. So part of Fidipper is, is providing food, and part of it is providing the nutrition um, education. And this might be my favorite picture. Um, this is from Spirit Lake Tribe for Mary Green Trottier, who's the director up there. And she just um, refurbished her whole center. Uh, and so it's just it's a place where you can get food with dignity. It's, it's a really great, great spot. So um, when um, the USDA and the Urban Institute look at um, Fidipper, it comes up as being like the healthiest food in America. Oh my God, that's amazing. <laughs> because I brought with me some show and tell, you can look at. So this is canned commodity beef. If you're like, oh, I've never seen canned commodity beef, here it is. Anyhow, um, I've spent about three years now with Fidipper. I've been to the national meetings, regional meetings, lots of centers. When um, I have one of my former students with me from MSU, we're going to leave and stop at Fidipper centers on the way back to um, Bozeman. And it just doesn't strike me as the healthiest food in America that I've been there. So let's just take a little closer look. So um, this is from the U.S. Government and it gives you the healthy eating index, so it's zero to 100. And the cl if you were at 100, you'd be a perfect eater, and if you were at zero, you wouldn't have any food at all. So, um, if you're in your mid 50s, like I am, a closer look means <laughs> like blow that way up. <laughs> so, you can see in the U.S., those um, numbers out of 100 are 59, 55, 68. Um, that's for the oldest one. So kind of a range there. And then this is my own published work with three other authors um, at MSU. And we looked at the food package with um, the 2010 Healthy Eating Index. Um, and so we found 66.38. And I am a meticulous person. I'm like, really? That's pretty good. That's higher than the average American diet. And it's higher than the SNAP diet. Um, so, um, and this is sort of a, a famous chart if you're in Fidipper land, um, and it shows all, this is from a 2005 uh, base, 100 base, but um, all person, they haven't, they don't have a new one, so that's why I'm showing that one, all persons, SNAP participants, and then Fidipper is 80, 86.6, uh, like, wow, how is it that great? I'll tell you <laughs> how it is. So, um, Fidipper, the USDA, and the Urban Institute analyzed it as offered, which means all of the food that would be possible to get. That's what they analyzed. So, I uh, want to tell you, I'm going to run through these points, but I'll do one at a time here. So, as soon as you start talking Fidipper, you're going to know about Exhibit O. So, Exhibit O tells you um, here's the category and then for at the top it's one person, two person, three person, four, five, six, seven, eight. That's the number of people in the household. So um, when they analyzed it, when they show a picture, you're like, wow, five boxes of cereal, that's pretty good. But you only get one box a month per person. So it's not like you walk out of there with each person getting five boxes this year, you walk out with one box to last 30 days. So um, this is a list of the fresh uh, vegetables. And um, my, uh, I have so much respect for these people on the food um, package review, especially Red Gates from Standing Rock. Um, Sue, who has literally stood on the steps of the Capitol and, and brought gross things from commodity foods and said, would you eat, eat the, we need better food. Um, and through that lobbying, they've got some fresh 
vegetables available. And so that's the list here. And I tried to do these in order. I'm pretty proud of my animation here. So carrots <laughs> and baby carrots and broccoli and yellow onions and red onions and russet potatoes and red potatoes. And I'm not going to read them all, although they are in order. Um, to impress you, um, <laughs> but <laughs> uh, you might be looking at this and going, "Wow, this is like awesome! This is pretty. This is pretty good stuff. Look at all of this stuff. They've got regular tomatoes, cherry tomatoes, and grape uh, tomatoes, and cucumbers, and green peppers. Like, wow! And um, and then I think this isn't so. There we go. Um, plus, on top, you can either have um, fresh vegetables or canned vegetables, and there's a pretty good list of the canned vegetables there. So there's um, carrots, and I won't. You can see, like, wow, this is really adding up. There's a lot of great things here. Um, and some things you might notice that the um, things I brought today, they're two weeks ago from a reservation from their Fidipper Center, um, and they look kind of off-label, but sometimes you go, and it's Del Monte or, or a label that um, most Americans would recognize. It, it just sort of differs each time you go on what label um, is on there. So, <laughs> kind of beating the dead horse here, but here's all of these vegetables and all of the canned vegetables, and there's some soups. So this looks just like it should have a score of 88 on the, on the healthy eating index. 45 different kinds of vegetables, and they're fresh, and they're canned, and there's soups and stews. But I want to point out to you that you get 11 units per person. <laughs> Not 45. You don't get one of everything that you're walking um, out with. So Fidipper provides 11 units, um, and that they're about a cup and a half for each. So, um, and I uh, carefully went through to show you, so like the red potatoes, if you chose red potatoes, you get three red potatoes for 30 days. So not like a big old sack of red potatoes, <laughs> three of them. Um, and um, I'm an economist, so we're always maximizing utility and things like that. So the tomato soup is the best way to maximize uh, your amount of vegetables. So that adds up to 19 and a half cups. And that looks like that's, that's a lot of cups of vegetables. But here's the USDA's recommendation. So the USDA runs for dipper, sets the food package, and they set these recommendations. Um, and Theodore Bird Rattler's with me. Um, so there's some uh, great basketball player from Browning uh, in uh, Blackfeet Nation in Montana playing basketball, winning. Um, <laughs> and so I just chose boys 14 to 18. Um, and the USDA recommends three cups of vegetables per day. So three times 30 is 90. 90 cups of vegetables a month, which looks like that. So just in case you forgot, <laughs> this is what they get, and that's what they recommend. So there's kind of a big difference there. And um, I was trying to pick out different graphics, and people stop by in my office that are like, we don't like that. We like this one. So I got a couple of them to show you. <laughs> um, so it works out to about two-thirds a cup of vegetables per day when the U.S. recommends three cups. It's pretty off. So, um, and another way to show this um, for um, females, you can see across time that Fidipper stays the same. There's no accommodation in there for gender or age, but the USDA recognizes that you know if you're a little girl this tall, that's different than being uh, a full-grown woman. So that you can see the variance in what they recommend and and then what they provide. So, um, I am a homework doer looker upper of things and once I figured out that I'm like hey that's not quite right so I looked at and you can too it's all on the internet um, these household um, food fact sheets and so this one's for vegetable soup and I'm passing around a vegetable soup it's a little tiny can of vegetable um, soup and I was reading it and they were saying that um, it's when diluted with water it's two servings, 
And then under the nutrition, one cup of prepared vegetable soups counts as one, like you add water and the vegetables double. Hmm. <laughs> That's pretty interesting. So I'm just an economist. I have a, I have a food science background. But, uh, so I went down to the lab in my own building, and I was like, here's a little can of soup. And I put it in a measuring cup. And then, because I'm a super dork, I separated out all of the letters. And, the, and I was like, oh my gosh, I've got to be careful that J will break. And let me tell you, the J doesn't break. Those letters are tough. I don't know what, I don't know what they're made out of, but it's, they're almost indestructible. So to show you I'm even more of a nerd, then I measured it all out like that. And... Um, our hairy call, the building I'm in, could use some more measuring cups that are, aren't quite as faded. But um, the biggest component out of the soup um, was the pasta. And then if you're feeling generous, um, and if you want to see all of the pictures I took during the whole thing, I have them with me, so I can show you. Um, <laughs> but it's about three quarters of a cup of vegetables, not two cups. OK. I'm getting the signal to go faster. So, um, and then in case you're like, well, you measured Campbell's, I wanted to tell you that I that I have those too. So, um, that got me to thinking about mushroom soup. <laughs> so, I looked at the mushroom soup, and the mushroom soup said that a cup of um, cream of mushroom soup counts as half a cup from the vegetable cream. Like that's really, I don't. That's amazing. <laughs> so I measured the <laughs> mushrooms in a cream of mushroom soup. And then you can see from Fred Dipper the actual um, can there. And vegetables are not any of the ingredients that's in the soup. And so these are a few examples. I just have 10 minutes left, so I'm going to have to go uh, super fast through them. So then um, I was like, the cream and chicken soup? So I was reading that a cream and chicken soup counts as a half a cup from the protein group. I'm like, really? That's just amazing. <laughs> so their, their nutrition facts is for six ounces, but the uh, writing is about one cup. But I'm, I'm an economist. I'm kind of good at math, so I, I can do that. Should be 28 grams, but it's only one gram of protein. Like, aha. So I measured it, <laughs> of course. Oh, and I can't measure chicken broth. Um, and even Ed can't do it in his lab, but um, those cans that I handed out on my way home from Montana, I'm increasing my sample size, and we have a meat science lab on campus that um, can analyze the protein, so that's my next step to do. Um, yeah, and you can, like, it doesn't add up. And then I thought, well, maybe, I'm just an economist, what do I what do I know? Maybe I should look at the USDA ounce equivalents of proteins in foods. And so that took me to the National Nutrient Database. And then I was looking at the National Nutrient Database. I'm like, wait a minute, because I told you I'm a, I'm a down the column across the row. Does that add up to what I think? And um, an ounce should be about six grams, and so a cup should be 38 grams, so then half a cup should be um, 19 grams, and one gram isn't like 19 grams, and I was starting to figure out why my own work showed that it was so nutritious, because the numbers aren't right on, on their end. Um, and now you're getting the hang of my personality. I'm like, well, let's look up peanut butter next. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> why stop there? Uh, so, uh, my other, my RDs and friends are like, you are, why do you think like that? I'm like, why don't you think like that? So, uh, I started looking, and then, and there's the equivalency for peanut butter is one tablespoon, but one tablespoon is half. The amount of protein as the other, like it's not right. I'm here to tell you it's not one mistake or, and I wish I had a week I could keep going, um, but, there, but there's some problems. <laughs> so, um, and then I thought I would just show you fruit too. So that's 10 units per person, um, but it should be 30 for, I stuck with boys. Um, so that's 25% of the recommended amount of fruit. So when you look at my plate, um, 
for boys, they've got about 16% of the vegetables they need, 25% of the um, fruit that they need, more than the grains that they need. It goes over the over the plate there. Um, and the protein, the way they figure it out, which I'm I'm on the protein kick now, um, but it shows right. I'm I'm not too confident that that's right. So um, I wanted to show you another thing. So. Um, I'm an economist, I like numbers, um, and so I was looking at the exhibit O, has everything, and I was looking at bakery mix, and I was like, all right, so if you're a one-person household, you get one um, every four months. Okay, if you're two people, then you get one every two months for both of you, so you get a quarter every month, and then if you're three people, you get one, but then if you're four people, shouldn't you get more? And then five, you get more, but six, seven, eight, it stays the same. And so I ask, because the second thing I do is ask a million questions, <laughs> a million of them. And I ask, and the USA said, oh, it all works out. It doesn't all work out. <laughs> it works out. Um, it's, I tried to, I did it with bakery mix and that wasn't very compelling. I thought pancakes, oh, we'll do it, pancakes, that makes sense. So you can see that um, if you're a household with five people, you get a lot more pancakes per month um, than you do. And it shouldn't be that the food package discriminates by household size, like that's not okay. Um, but uh, it's, I'm hoping I'll tell all of you and then my voice is now, you know, 60 times louder. Yay, we'll tell them. It does not all work out, it doesn't. And this is one of several um, examples in there. So then I was looking at um, lactose intolerance because if you didn't know, um, there's not a lot of recent um, data on that. And if one of my grants with Ed would ever get funded about lactose intolerance, we would do it um, ourselves. But the estimate, many sources, this is from the National Institutes of Health, is between 80 and 100% of American Indians are lactose intolerant. So if that's the case, I ask why is there milk in the um, food package? Let's see, I think I, I tried to abbreviate it, so next slide's a different thing. Um, because if you don't have the milk in the food package, if you take that out, which you should if you're lactose intolerant because it's making you sick, and it's, we used to think it was just a little diarrhea, don't worry, but now we know um, that it's a lot more complicated with the microbiome and, and the absorption of medicine and nutrients. and what. It's not okay. If you have diarrhea all the time, that isn't, that's not okay. <laughs> it's not, besides uncomfortable, it's, it's physiologically not good. Um, and so I brought that um, up to the tippy top, and I just sort of got a, you know, nothing. I'm like, no, you're making, you know, 80 to 100,000. If it's 100,000, you're making all those people sick. Like, not okay. Um, so I would encourage you to speak and um, see if we can get some um, lactose-free alternatives, and um, you could just take milk all the way out, but if you do that, then the um, numbers you get low in calcium and vitamin D, like those nutrients are all packaged within the, within the milk in this. If they added traditional foods, it would, it would work fine. So, um, I, you can see, I'm like, oh, I'm on a roll now. So, I looked, <laughs> um, my colleague Ed does a lot of work with the Intertribal Buffalo um, Council, and so I've heard him speak many times, and I knew that the omega-6 to the omega-3 omega ratio um, for grass-fed bison was around two, two and a half, and I looked in the academic literature across many articles, that's just what it is. So I looked it up in the National Nutrient Database, and it said 7.5. I'm like, no, because you want it small. There's um, lots of studies that show if you can keep that ratio around four or less, that um, there's a 70% reduction in chronic disease. And traditional diets are right around that one to one, up to four to one, and that's why uh, traditionally American Indians were so 
healthy. Our American diet now is about 25 to 1, um, and that interferes with um, the omega-3s and omega-6 compete with brain receptors. Um, it's not good. We should aim back towards, all of us, all Americans should aim back towards those more traditional diets where animals ate grass, not corn, because buffalo don't eat corn, they eat grass. Uh, so do cows. Corn makes them sick, and we eat them. That's weird. So <laughs> anyhow, they said that, and then remember, you want that short ratio, and so I looked it up, and they said that the canned commodity beef was 1.7. That's like as good as salmon. Like, no. <laughs> I don't think so, because you can see it does not look like the healthiest cut of meat in America, because it's not. So we went into the lab. Here we are in the lab. My job was to do the dishes and take pictures. Um, they didn't let me touch any, <laughs> which was good. I shouldn't be allowed to. Um, so there we are, and we found that we looked um, across several buffalo herds. The ratio is 2 to 1, and the ratio for the canned commodity beef is 39 to 1. And this all starts explaining why it is that healthy eating index comes out of <laughs> those high numbers. So... Um, I wanted to talk just for two seconds about um, the omega-6s that are in vegetable oil. So we're aiming, we're aiming for that balance, that traditional balance. And sometimes you'll read in USDA materials that like yeah, Native Americans ate a low-fat diet, was high in fiber. I'm like, they did not do that. <laughs> the historical documents show that um, in Buffalo country, where, where I'm from, that they ate the hump first. It was the tongue, the liver, the kidneys. That's where all of the nutrients are. And then the hump where the fat is, because that fat is full of omega-3s, and that's, that's what you need for brain function. Um, so there's also some new evidence at MSU they're working on in the lab that um, the omega-6, um, well, vegetable oil is total. It's 100% omega-6. And butter, fat, um, it has this um, omega-7 in it that's good for balancing it out. And there's several studies, I'm happy to share with you if you like, that show that type 2 diabetes and obesity are lower in people that drink high fat or consume high fat dairy than skim milk. And children are thinner when they have whole milk than when um, fat milk. So, um, but these are people in Fidipper, they're very low income people. And your choice is to have a whole bunch of vegetable oil or a little tiny bit of butter. And so the incentive is, is to have, because you're hungry, a um, whole bunch of vegetable oil. And then I'd point out, just looking at that light buttery spread, how it goes two, three, six, six, nine, nine, twelve. <laughs> like, now see when you divide things by a bigger number, it gets smaller. Um, so it's not, it's not the same. So you can see the, the difference by families is seven and Eight odd-numbered families get more food per person than even-numbered families. Uh, all right, so um, I had a little thing here. Um, I thought that was about, anyhow, there was a report to Congress in 2008 about lactose intolerant. So when I present, they're like, we didn't know anything about that, that they did, <laughs> um, because it's, that's been around. So um, I know, because. Um, Believe me, I've, I've stood and said it. Um, well, we should have some more fruits and vegetables in this food package because um, everyone agrees that fruits and vegetables are healthy. And we have a high rate of liver disease and heart disease and um, type 2 diabetes. We know fruit and vegetables would be good. Um, and what I'm met with back is, well, this is just a supplement program. It's not meant to be the whole diet. It's just a supplement program, but there's a problem with a supplement program in a food desert. So, um, for those of you that are native, all I guess everyone here works with native communities. Some you might look at this map and go, "Hey, <laughs> that looks." Because I can tell you, that's Northern Cheyenne, that's Crow, that's Fort Belknap. There's Blackfeet. Like those are the reservations in Montana. Those those dark um, areas. So. Um, 
They're in food deserts, of course, a lack of access to affordable fruits, vegetables, meats, dairy, eggs. Um, and I am arguing strongly on videotape, which makes me nervous, um, <laughs> that the USDA dollars would be best if they provided people more fruits and vegetables and let people buy their own cereal for $1.58, uh, which you can find at the convenience store and you can't find those fruit and vegetables. Um, yeah, so the bottom line is the USDA needs to increase the budget for FDIPR. And so I know they'll tell me, well, we can't afford that. And I would answer, you can't afford it because one out of every three Indian Health Service dollars is spent on diabetes. I just picked diabetes. Um, so out of the $4.3 billion IHS budget, $1.4 billion, as in billion, with a B, billion, <laughs> gets spent on diabetes alone. The whole cost of FDIPR, with the warehouses and administrator cost, and the, the whole thing is $119 million. So um, I've got another one sort of coming up here. I want to, I thought, you know, like every good talk should have a little catch phrase. Um, so what we've been talking about at, at MSU, and I know nationwide, um, is that food is health care and medicine is sick care. And your dollars, as an economist third, they're better spent on health care in preventative care, not to mention the moral imperative to have health people, but just financially, you're better off investing in health care than you are trying to make up for it um, in sick care. And so um, I, some people are like, shouldn't you be doing, I'm like, I'm running my PowerPoint, I got my spreadsheet, I'm calculating. <laughs> so that's about the font size shows you the difference between 119 million and, and 1.4 billion on um, diabetes. And vegetables, I'm here to tell you, are a lot cheaper than dialysis or insulin or amputation or death and all of the sorrow and grief and awfulness. So um, you may think that I'm here to talk smack about FDPR, but I'm not. <laughs> That's not why I'm here. I really believe, my heart of hearts, I'm totally convinced Native peoples in the U.S. can lead the country and the world to better health by showing strong health improvement through nutrition. And um, lots of you know Janie Hip, so that's the back of her head there. <laughs> I'm sure you'll recognize her. Be sure to tell her I put her up, up there. Um, across from her is um, the president of the Navajo Nation, Russell Begay. Um, and Janie is such a hero for FDIPR. She organized for the first time in American history, which is just so hard to believe, in February of 2016, the first tribal consult about the food that's delivered to um, reservations. I, I was there because I took that picture, the back of her head. Um, <laughs> and um, these are kind of fuzzy, but I want to point out Mary here. Mary Green Trottier um, is just my hero. She is so valiant in the um, fight for improving the dipper. Um, and in the chair, let's see, I can make the mouse kind of go there. And the chair is Red Gates, who I told you stood on Capitol Hill and, and got the addition of fruits and vegetables. And uh, that's my colleague, Ed, because they asked me to come. I presented to a little committee from the National Congress of American Indians about nutrition. Like, <laughs> the biochemist with PhD, he's coming with me, right? <laughs> so he came with me. Um, and of the things, and I should have asked President Begay if I could have used this quote, but I wasn't that organized. So... But this is what he said. We were at this huge table with all the big mucky mucks and presidents of all sorts of nations and governors. It was big. Um, and he said, my people want to eat their own food. Oh, my God. That's it. <laughs> like, that says everything. That's a moment I, I will really, I, like, oh, my gosh. That's, that's it. And he talked about the Navajo people wanting to raise their own beef and their own corn and that the USDA, instead of buying it from some gigantic conglomerate corporation, could purchase the um, beef and corn from the Navajo and make that what's available in the FDIPR centers. So I am so excited to show you that six years 
I'm not excited about the six years, but six years after a congressional mandate to add traditional food um, into the food package, and that was um, championed by Janie Hip and Mary Green Trottier and Red Gates and Roxanna Newsom, heroes of mine from Fidipper, um, that there it is. There's my friend Jerry down at the Crow Fidipper two weeks ago. And there's the blue um, corn mill, the Navajo blue corn mill that's there. So it's super exciting. And um, buffalo. They had buffalo available um, at the Fidipper Center. So we're on this great, great track. Um, and this is this awesome um, commercial kitchen in Livingston, which is one mountain pass over from where I live in Bozeman, um, and this, um, it's at a, a food pantry, like a food bank, um, and they figured out a way to get around the USDA um, commercial license barriers that are present on tribes so that um, folks can come use this. I've got 10 minutes, perfect. So um, farmers in Livingston live in Montana, so like we're not growing tomatoes in particular or tropical plants, but we grow beets and carrots and onions. So farmers have beets, and they want to sell them for a lot of money, of course. Um, but they're dirty, and they're on the back of their truck, and their best hope is the farmer's market for like $2 a pound. Um, but farmers can rent this space um, at the food pantry. It's right in the middle of this little town for $15 an hour, which is super cheap. And for $15 an hour, I'm a foodie. And so this equipment, I'm like, ooh, can I touch that? Like, yeah. And I'm like, no, I've never seen, only on the Food Network have I seen this. Uh, it's a cool, <laughs> it's a cool kitchen. So um, in a very short time, they have huge things. They can uh, clean the beets and blanch them. He's got a big machine that um, has a blade. You can do 80 pounds of french fries in one minute. Like, wow. So they can put the julienned uh, beets through there, and then they have a vacuum sealer, and then they have a flash freezer, which I'd never seen before, it's so cool, and then a, and a big freezer. So the farmers then can take that packaged food and sell it to the restaurants at a premium dollar, and like a big drum roll, with the $15 they paid for rent, then the um, director buys the beets from the farmer to have available for the local people to have fresh beets, fresh local Beets. And while I, if I have a few minutes left, I'd tell you an, another story there. There's lots of good ones. But um, a nearby rancher had a bull break his leg. And, um, you know, bulls are not very cooperative, <laughs> laying down still and recuperating. So he was just going to have to destroy the animal and bury it out somewhere. Um, but the director of Fidipper was, or not Fidipper, of the food center, was able to write him a note um, for a full donation for the market price. So that was a great tax write-off for him. And then because it's a, a commercial USDA-approved kitchen, they um, were able to process the bull. And then a little two-pound chubs out front was frozen bull from Farmer Brown, um, available for the folks in Livingston uh, to come and get it. So it was um, that model where the local food is, is they're helping local producers, providing that market opportunity for them, and then the people at the food bank um, get to have that food, and um, it gets even better because he does uh, culinary classes there, and then people that were needing food now have jobs because they've got these culinary skills, and, and it goes on. So, um, I want to conclude by saying that I totally think food sovereignty is where it's at, and um, Fidipper needs improvement for sure, and they need to get their numbers straight. Um, they can hire me for a lot of money if they want, um, and I'll tell them about the numbers, uh, or they can read it, I'm going to publish it. Um, but um, FDIPA really can be a, a huge key partner because those USDA warehouses and 276 of them across the country could adopt that um, food pantry model and have those commercial kitchens and have a way for local producers to, to value add and, and, and go up. So with that, are there any questions?